Hey folks, it is November 28th, 2021. And, um, you know, I recorded this episode with my mom back in late April to release for Mother's Day. And always sort of thought when she passed, I would release it again. And, uh, She passed very early this morning, and I didn't expect to have to contend with this this soon, but here we are. So, can't imagine ever having a better mom, and uh, I'm just getting ready to catch a flight back home to be with my family. I appreciate you listening. This episode is brought to you by Windrose Recovery, a family of premier addiction treatment programs in southeastern Wisconsin. Privately owned, Windrose Recovery offers a full continuum of personalized care for those struggling with addiction, including the Manor for residential treatment, Midwest Detox for inpatient detoxification, and Windrose Counseling for outpatient treatment. With highly personalized treatment focused on trauma, Dr. Chantel Thomas and her expert team offer an authentic experience, creating the kind of deep emotional change that's crucial for long-term recovery. If you or someone you love is struggling with addiction, call Windrow's Recovery at 414-409-5300. You can learn more about Windrow's Recovery by clicking the link in the show notes or by visiting windrowsrecovery.com. Thank you for listening to The Path to Authenticity. My name's Tom Gentry. I think of this show as the opposite of small talk. You'll hear real conversations with real people who know who they are. We talk about what makes them who they are, how they became who they are, and how we might become truer expressions of who we are. I'm Martha Gentry, and this is The Path to Authenticity. Nowhere to run, nothing to hide from the government's crying eye. Take yourself to Soma Holiday. The Path to Authenticity proudly supports the I Speak Media Foundation, advancing media literacy education through an evolving series of outreach programs within the communities that need it most. For more information, visit ispeakmedia.org. If this is your first time here, thanks for checking it out. If not, thanks for coming back. I'm Tom Gentry, and this is The Path to Authenticity. Episode 122 for Mother's Day 2021, featuring my mom, Martha Gentry, Martha Agnes Gentry, who will be 91 years old in August. So a few months back, a friend of mine and a former guest of the show, Dr. Chantal Thomas, featured her mother on her podcast, which is called Blind Spots. And... I'll leave a link to that in the show notes. It was an incredible episode. They went really, really deep. Tears were shed. It was fantastic. And she did a great job with it. So my first thought was, man, that would be tough to have my mom on the podcast. And then pretty soon I thought, I ought to have my mom on the podcast. And there are a couple reasons why I wanted to do that. First of all, I wanted to know more about my mom. 
especially at the age she's at now, I wanted to be able to ask her questions about her life, which I did. And I learned some things. I learned some things about her. I learned some things about myself, things that happened with me that I didn't know about. And it was a really great conversation. So I wanted to be able to learn, first of all. I wanted to be able to know her and feel closer to her. So mission accomplished with that. I feel like since we had this conversation, I feel even more connected to her than I did before. But another reason I wanted to do this is because one of the sort of unexpected gifts of this podcast has been the way people have responded to me when I have featured their loved ones on the podcast. You know, a friend of mine, Terry Shapiro, who was on very early on, I want to say he was on episode 15, you know, his daughter made a point to thank me for having her dad on the podcast. And one of the earliest episodes was with an abstract expressionist painter named Mimi Langla, who's an incredible human being who shared with me all sorts of things that her family didn't know about her. So her son, her daughter, her grandchildren, they all got to learn things about her that they didn't know before. And she came back to me thanking me for this gift. So that was just, I knew there were things about this podcast that I was going to enjoy. I knew there, I, it was going to be satisfying for me. I didn't even think about anything like that. So having had that experience, I wanted to do this with my mom because I knew that I would get a lot out of it and in hope that other family members would get something out of it and just always have this. You know, we'll always have her voice no matter what. We'll always have these stories that are being documented, these conversations. So obviously this is close to my heart. Another thing I'll say in, in thinking about how to open this episode, I don't like small talk. One of the ways I've described this podcast is as the opposite of small talk, which I find relatively agonizing most of the time. You know, I'll have a deep conversation with you. Even if we're strangers, I'll, I'll invest the time to get to know you and have a real conversation and learn about you. I've always felt more comfortable in one-on-one -on -one situations like that, having meaningful conversations than in larger groups, having less meaningful conversations. And I think the reason why is because I have always had conversations like this with my mom, my entire life. So even this gift that I have for having these types of conversations with people that has served me in my career for a long time, and I never really picked up on it for a long time, and has translated very easily to this podcast, it comes from my relationship with my mom. So when I have someone come on here and they open their heart, you know, I'm able to do that, that ability to make someone feel safe and comfortable enough to do that with me, that originated in my relationship with my mom. So I really loved doing this. I enjoyed it a lot. It's, it, and I hope whoever's listening enjoys it as much as I enjoyed doing it. So I wish you all a happy Mother's Day. And here you go, Martha Gentry. Don't let her run. Nothing to
to hide from the government's crying So eyes. you said you had a busy day, Take huh? I had a busy day. Uh, Ann came over and brought me a few things I needed, and uh, Jane came over at lunchtime to take care of lunch because Beth's working the whole weekend. And, uh, oh, you called, and J.C. called, and somebody else, and Ann brought medication that they gave her at the drugstore. We didn't even know what it was for or who ordered it. So she's going to call the doctor's office and try to find out about that. Okay. It's a funny thing these days how they do things. I mean, they just send you a pack of medicine and you're supposed to take it, I guess, whether you know what it is or not. <laughs> I guess so. So, well, I have to tell you, I haven't talked about this a whole lot, but I've told a few friends of mine that I was planning on doing this. Oh, did you? Yeah. And I got to say, everybody is eagerly anticipating. They want to hear my mom. Oh, yeah. boy. Yeah. Okay. So uh, so I'm happy to have you on here, and I appreciate you doing this for Thank me you. and with me. So we talked a little bit before when I first asked you about this and why I wanted to do it. And one of the main reasons why I wanted to do it is because – I want to know more about you. I want to hear more about you. And so often when I have other people on the podcast, you know, their kids will thank me. Some grandkids will thank me because they got to hear things about their dad or loved one that they didn't know before. And they never got to hear that side of them. Well, we just don't think to ask them when we're very young. We don't. You know, I, I mentioned to you that one of the reasons I wanted to do this is because, you know, with dad, who for those listening passed in 2005, I, I just wish I talked to him more. I wish I asked him questions about his life and got to know more about him. So, so he I wasn't a big talker. I know. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> He wasn't a big talker, but he was fun. And, yeah, he uh, could be a lot of fun. And, you know, I think he's one of those people who doesn't have a whole lot to say always, but when he talks, he says something. I think that's... that. Would yeah, be you better listen. You better be listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, so dear. what year were you born, Mom? 1930. 1930. Yeah, so, my parents got married in the... Big depression. Yeah. And you're the oldest, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And talk about your siblings. Well, I have a brother that's 15 months younger than I am, but he passed in 2004. My sister is six years younger than me, and uh, she's 84, and she gets around, does pretty well yet. Mm -hmm. Little, little shaky, and she has more health problems than I do, I think are serious ones. I don't really know that, but she does pretty well. So mom, what's the, what's the earliest memory that you have? Oh, I don't know. I remember when my little brother came home from the hospital, that was quite a big deal. And, um, I remember one Christmas when we didn't have much, you know, because it was he, my dad and my uncle, they made presents, and mother did some sewing. And anyhow, I got a doll, big blonde doll with long card legs, and you know how they used to make them. Anyhow, it had a polka-dotted organza dress on it. And uh, first thing you know, I know my dad went down to shine his shoes and Mother washed the dress, and he used the fresh shoe shine right. <laughs> I was so hurt, and um, I don't know why she didn't crochet that doll a dress, because she did that stuff all the time. I never thought about it when I was young, but I don't know why I didn't ask her to make Dolly a dress, because she remained naked the whole rest of her life. <laughs> so that was Dolly. How, how, how old were you when you stopped carrying around Dolly? 
Oh, I I never liked dolls much. I played with my little brother, my baby sister. So you I didn't... wasn't really wild about dolls. So what were you wild about? Oh, I don't know. I liked teddy bears, but I didn't. Uh, I were wasn't wild about toys. We played a lot of games at our house. Like board. As soon games. as we were big enough to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, I remember that. You, you, I mean, you pretty much always said that you were a bit of a tomboy growing up. Is that right? Oh, I know. I love ball. Baseball? Softball. We played softball in those days. We didn't play with the baseballs, but we did play softball on the school grounds, you know. And it was a small school. The boys didn't have enough to feel the team, see. So I was usually lucky enough to get to play with them. Hmm. I loved it. Well, you were probably as good as some of them, right? I was a pretty good pitcher. <laughs> and so I usually got to play. So did you ever play any organized sports? No, I thought about it at one point, joining the girls' team here in Kokomo. I even went to one of the practices and watched them and everything, but I never liked the way girls played ball. They didn't play that well like boys, you know? <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it's the truth, Tom. I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of them that do play well, but there weren't that many on that team, and I didn't want to play with them. Well, I imagine that in this day and age, um, women's sports, they take it a lot more seriously maybe than they did back in those days. Oh, I'm sure. So it was just for fun, but they did play other teams. So you're talking about the 1940s, right? Well, if you were yeah, born in I, 1930, guess, I guess it would be. Mm-hmm. What year did you graduate from high, sc- high school? Would that have been 48? 48. 48. Mm-hmm. I mean, what was high school like for you? Oh, I liked it pretty well. I liked all the teachers, and, and uh, I made a lot of new friends over there at the high school. And um, it, it, I enjoyed it. What what subjects did you like? Oh, I liked algebra. I loved algebra. And uh, I had a wonderful history teacher, and I loved that. And... Uh, English, too. I, I loved learning English. And I was glad. That, um, it was interesting because boys don't usually like English. You know, when I was glad when I got into high school English classes because in the, in our schools, we worked real hard at English and those studies, you know. And I was I was up with the top of them in learning. And some of the kids from the other schools, they had an awful hard time. Yeah. So I was proud of the school I'd been to. Well, I've even remarked to people over the years, I feel like growing up there in Indiana, I got a really good public ed- education. The schools were good, right? Well, they say they aren't now. But I don't know. Well, I had a good experience with them, and it sounds like you did too. Well, I did. I did. I did. really did. Anybody that was willing to put in the time. Yeah. You know, got a good education. They did. And so we had some really, really good teachers. Yeah. So did you ever think of going to college or anything like that, Mom? Well, I I kind of wanted to go to nursing school, but there was no money for that. And I liked um, shorthand and typing and those things. And I developed a skill at taking shorthand, mm-hmm. which was really good, almost high enough to do work for the lawyers, just quite short of that. You're supposed to know 120 words a minute, be able to take that for five minutes. I couldn't take it for five, but I could do it for three. But anyway, I got a real good job coming out of, out of school, and so I just stuck with that. Now, where was that? Well, you mean my first job? Yeah. Well, my first job was at 16. My dad took me down and introduced me to the manager of, the, of a five and dime store. And I went to work there the next week and worked until I got into high school. By that time, I was working in the office at McClellan's. 
and uh, I was working. Um, I was I was good at the commercial subjects, you know. Yeah. And so uh, I, John, uh, Mr. Um, John Paul Jones was his name. He was a dean of boys, and he hired me. He let me work in his office, and so I worked in his office for about six months, and then his wife owned uh, Northern Indiana Supply, mm -hmm. and uh, he got me a job working for his wife, and I worked there until uh, I got the job at the pottery. Which was Gerber Pottery, right? Was that? Mm -hmm. Kokomo Sanitary. So they made, Gerber. They made toilets? Toilets and, and sinks and all that stuff, and we actually had five factories. They did they did uh, shower stalls, and we had uh, plumbing fixtures and all that. They had Nancy China, mm. and um, there was another one. I can't think what that was right now. Showers, showers. Anyhow, there was five factories, and I worked for the vice president mm. and uh, then the owner, and did all their dictation and everything. I had a good job. Yeah. So then... Where did Dad come in in relation to this? Oh, well, I was working down at the Five and Dime store. And Phyllis, his sister Phyllis, was working down there. And he'd come down there and he'd stand in the front of the store and stare at everybody for a long time. Just stare at the whole place, you know. And I thought, gee, he's really, um, oh, what's the word? Anyhow, he just sort of just checking everybody out. Was to it see. strange? Did it feel strange? Well, I thought he thought pretty much of himself, <laughs> and he did. But anyhow, finally, a fellow said one day, he said, Martha, would you consider uh, going out with my brother Jack? She says, I'd see him stand up there in front. And he did, he'd come over and say hi to her, you know, but he wouldn't stay there. But uh, I, I finally said yes, and he came over one one evening. It was actually as my birthday, and he uh, walked me home. And so that's what started all of that. And we had fun with the Phyllis and John. They were married, and, and they could take us to dances and things. You know, we went to at the at the um, base. The naval base was up there, and uh, we went there. We went to Monticello to the parties and dances up there. John John and Phyllis used to be a lot of fun when they were young. Yeah. But but they got old and sick. So your first sort of date with dad was on what birthday would that have been? I think it was the sixteenth. Wow. I didn't realize you were that young when you guys started to date. Yeah. We dated I dated for four years. So he was already was he already back from yeah, service? he's back from the army. Mm -hmm. hmm. He's four years older than me. Yeah. So anyhow, so then my folks liked him. They liked him. So uh, you dated for four years before you got married in 1950, right? You got married in 1950, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. So what was dating him like for those four years? Like, how often would you see him, and what what did you guys do? Oh, two or three evenings a week we'd go. We'd go to a picture show sometimes, or we'd go to visit some of our friends. Or We didn't have many of them. I don't remember what we did, to tell you the truth. Do you remember uh, the first movie you guys saw together? No, I don't think so. You remember any of them? Uh, yeah, I remember the night we were going to go see Bing Crosby and Going My Way. Okay. It was a wonderful old movie, you know, and uh, we talked about it, and I told him I really wanted to see that. So he said, well, he'd take me, and we were going to go on the next Friday night. I don't know if it was Friday or Saturday. might have been Saturday. But anyway, um, don't you know he came in there on Saturday or some Friday night and Told me he decided he didn't want to go, that he'd already went with his buddies. Uh. I said, you're kidding me. He said, no, no. He said, uh, I, I, don't really, I don't really want to go. I didn't care for it that much. And I said, well, you do what you want to do, but I'm going to the picture show. 
And so he said, well, wait, wait. He says, uh, I really need to talk to Bill before we can do anything. And I said, well, I told him how much time we had, you know. And so he said, okay, so don't you know we had to work, walk out there to State Street so he could see his brother. The, tr- the truth of the whole thing was I don't think he had any money left. Mm-hmm. But he would never say that, you know. So we got out there and they had their private talk. And so then his radio picture show. So we went and we had a good time. We loved the show. And they had what you call bank night. And, and every or one Friday night a month, they give away money. Mm-hmm. And everybody had a ticket. Got a chance on that bank night. Don't you know he hit that bank night and won twenty five hundred dollars. Really? God, he was so happy. Yeah, twenty five hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. That was a so lot. So he bought of his mother new then. furniture. Oh yeah. Wow. Mother didn't have any furniture, so he bought her furniture for the house. And, and uh, but anyhow, he was. Uh, at one point, I said to him, "You're going to split with me." I said, you wouldn't have won if it wasn't for me. And he says, he got this strange look on his face. And I said, oh, I'm only kidding. I wouldn't take your money. You know, that you won. Right. But uh, that was a big night. Yeah. Never forget it. Mm -hmm. Mm. Any other uh, big dates that you remember that stand out? Mm -hmm. We got to go to the, we went to the cheer guild dances. At the uh, well, they'd have them at the uh, armory at that time, and uh, I enjoyed that several times. They had Eddie Howard there, and I just loved him, and uh, things like that. Things like that. Mm. We didn't go. We didn't go all the way around and around a lot. We'd take walks and go to the park and watch a ball game, maybe, or stop at the custard at the, the uh, Crescent Dairy and get a. A big soda or something like that, you know, it's a big deal. Hmm. So then you got married in 1950. What was the wedding like? Oh, it was very nice. It was very nice. It was just, uh, Ursilia stood up with me and, uh, Jack, my brother Jack stood up with him because his best friend was not a Catholic and uh, we weren't able to get permission for him to be the best man. Who would that have been, Mom? Well, his name was um, um, what was his first name? Not God, a, I can't. Not I can't say his name. Known. Well, you didn't know him, no, because he 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 came from Tennessee and some with some of his family and. Uh, Really good guy, a swell guy, and um, he he went back back to Tennessee after we were married a couple of years. Mm-hmm. But uh, Al Al Owens was okay. his name. Did Dad stay in touch with him? Oh, for a while. Mm-hmm. You know how Dad was with letters and things. So then, where the reception in the church basement? No, we didn't have that. Mother and Dad had a wedding breakfast, and so that's what Jack and I had, a wedding breakfast. They took us to the Francis Hotel, and we had uh, my my family, and we had Jack's family. So, and then they so was invited... it before the wedding, in the morning before? No, no, after. So after you had a wedding. morning wedding. Yeah, sort of, well, sort of like lunch, you know, brunch. Okay, okay. And it was a regular meal, served meal, and and uh, per- Perkin Helen and Mary G and Dave and the Debras, who Dad worked for, that was all that was there. There wasn't anybody else there. So um, it was nice. It was nice. Music was there. Aunt Florence came. Aunt Florence was there, and now she lived in far New southern Albany. Indiana, New yeah. Albany, which was probably and my five mother's hours the mother's away dad and his there. wife were there. And that's all. So was there a, there a little band or anything like that, or no? No, no band. No band. So Just breakfast. Then what about the honeymoon? I went to Chicago. So that was in September, right? Mm-hmm. 
So when uh, it would have been cold already, right? Probably. No, it was a very pleasant day. It was very pleasant. And, um, you know, I remember, I think you guys told me that you stayed in the hotel and you could see the Buckingham Fountain from your hotel window. Yes, it was right in front of it. Mm-hmm. Which I think is a Hilton now, probably. I don't know. Yeah. But well, I know, I, I looked out the window and I saw that. Don't you know, he dropped his toilet, that to- toothbrush down the toilet, had to go get another toothbrush. He had to leave the room. Oh, I don't know if that was an accident or if he just said he had, if it just left for a short time. I don't know. He wasn't gone too long, but he came back. And so uh, I told him the next day about the fountain. And he said, oh, there's nothing out there. What? So he got back after midnight and it turned off. Oh. Took a while because we took the train to Chicago. So he got back after midnight. So what, he left on your wedding night and came back? Well, we hadn't been there any time before he claimed he had lost his, he uh, dropped his toothbrush in the john. So then how long was he gone? Oh, 15, 20 minutes, okay. nothing. Okay. Nothing. But by the time he got back, it was late and the, and the fountain was but, Or he didn't look out. I don't know, hmm. you know, but he didn't see it all lit up. It was beautiful. Yeah. And that's the last day of the of the year that they turned that on. Oh, wow. 30th of September, see, so it wasn't there the next night. So he knew I was just seeing things. <laughs> oh, boy. So so then um, did you guys already have where you were going to live lined up and all that? What, where, how'd that work? Out? Yeah, we had found a, he had found an apartment for us over on Taylor Street and, and uh, Larry and. Uh, Who's my dad's brother. Maybe Bill, the other, his two brothers, they cleaned it all up for us. Turned out they had bugs all over the place. But by the time we got back, there was a million dead ones, but we got them all and cleaned it up, and it made a nice little place for us. We lived there until, oh, I guess probably February or March of the next year, and then we bought the little house over on Webster Street. Oh, yeah. So, Mm -hmm. and then, what year was Mary born? 51. Okay, so you got started pretty quickly having kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things you said to me was, you know, you don't know what you'd have to talk about or what you did that'd be worth talking about. And, you know, one of the things, and talking to other people about this, that that just seemed like such a crazy statement to me because you raised eight kids. I mean, you know, that's a lot of time, first of all, carrying children in your, you know. It is. It's a long time. And then, you know, and then raising eight kids. I mean, I graduated from high school in 1991. So for, for 40 years, yep, you were raising kids. And uh, turned out pretty well, too. <laughs> well, thank you for saying At least I'm that. proud of them, but I'm yeah. proud of all of you. Yeah, but other ones, special, some of them a little more special than the others because it's all, it's all in different ways, you know. But uh, even so, I'm proud of all of you. Love you all. Yeah, and but and and you're all very different. Yeah. I'll tell you something Mark said about the girls. When Linda died, you know, that was pretty painful for all of us. And yeah. uh, even though we expected it and everything, but uh, she, when she found out she was going to die, she accepted it very well. And she came home and, and she told us, and all the girls went over to see her and everything, you know, because we knew she was going quickly. And uh, my your brother Mark was over there and he says, my God, those girls are a force. And I said, I know. They just got in and they picked out what she's going to wear. Everything got planned. It was, it was, and everybody was happy. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I feel like having five sisters has been a pretty significant 
um, influence in my life. And, and not only having five older sisters, but, you know, having five sisters like them. Yeah, that's pretty special. <laughs> because, you know, when I describe them to people, I mean, not a one of them is a pushover or a no. wallflower. Or, um, you know, all of them are really spirited, powerful women. They are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So where'd they get that, Mom? Well, between your dad and I, I mean, they've all got a mind of their own. And, and you know, if I just talk to people sometimes and I'd say, well, my kids are always arguing about something, but. You know, they're all leaders, so they're all fighting to be the head, head honcho over there. Yeah. I felt that way, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. Mm -hmm. um, you boys are a little different on that, I guess, I think, because you were so much further apart. Mm, yeah. That, yeah we that were, timing wasn't all that good on yeah. that. But. Well, you know, I mean, you can't do everything. <laughs> you eight no. kids. Come on. No. Yeah. yeah. But. Yeah, no, I, I feel like um, some of the values that I got from, you know, being your son is, you know, and, and I talk about this, that I was somewhere talking about this the other day. Um, it was uh, like a talk that was given about what, what was the one thing that, what's the one thing that you should teach your children or that your parents taught you that. And, you know, you really, I got from you, you know, you got to stand up for what's right. Absolutely. And, um, and it has served me very well, especially in employment situations, because, you know, there are a lot of times, uh, especially when you're working in teams and a big company and there's a lot of stuff going on that, they're just things that need to be said that people are afraid to say. I know it. I know and, it. And I. Um, are you comfortable with that? Well, I don't know if I'd say I'm comfortable with it, but I, it, I get it out. I say it, Yeah. you know, good. Um, and, uh, and that is a leadership quality. It sure is. And uh, I think, I think we are all leaders in one way or the other. And I, I do too. I've, I've always identified more with leaders than followers. And I feel like I got that from you guys too. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think your dad was too. Yeah. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. I mean, because mm -hmm. and, he worked so hard to get what he got. He worked hard and uh, never quit. Never quit. Yeah. Well, and, you know, so one of the things that I got in my childhood that not many people my age did is, you know, we had dinner every night at five o'clock every single night together was the one time that, you know, we all were together. I like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what was also good about it is that we talked and um, and, you know, dad would talk about his work day and, you know, we. I, we talked about politics some, you know, we talked about what was going on in the community and in the world and I hey, feel, church. yeah. And I feel like, um, you know, you really taught us to think for ourselves. Well, that was my intent. Yeah. Well, I'm, mm -hmm. it, get it worked with me, you know? Um, and, you know, one of the things that's interesting, and I've talked to Mary about this a little bit over the years, my oldest sister, about how, um, you know, she's 23 years older than I am. And it, it's, it was a much different experience for her growing up in the family than it was for me, obviously, or anyone else. Oh, yes. Yes, it was. Mm-hmm. So all of us, you know, we all have 
we all got those things from you guys, but we all have our own different experience. Of, Mary uh, feels like she raised you all. <laughs> well, she probably <laughs> deserves some credit, right? Well, she does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She does. Well, I mean, you know, come she on. She helped out a lot. She really did. Yeah. And, I mean, uh, eight kids. I feel like in some ways I had, you know, a bunch of parents. <laughs> I do. I'm not surprised. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel like, um, well, and, you know, Beth, who's the youngest, second youngest and six years older than me, was at that age where, I mean, it seemed like she was really happy when I came along. She got to have a little brother. and Oh, she, she was. She seems yeah. like the We pictures. got her out of school that day, so she go to the hospital with us to get you. Yeah. She wanted to go so bad, she couldn't wait. Yeah. And it, we were talking today about how I had to get on to the kids about they'd all come over on the weekends, you know, to visit. And uh, the ones that were there, of course, they played with you and toed you around all the time. Well, you got so you cried all day Monday. <laughs> and so I had to set them down. You know, now we don't play with Tom all day Saturday and Sunday. You can talk to him and everything else, but you're not carrying him around and entertaining him all the time because I said I can't. Handle Mondays, and so they they did they did better, but that's how it went. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, talk about when I was born. What do you remember about that? Oh, let's see. I know I can remember my water broke at home, made a mess, and uh, I had to get out of there right now, you know, go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have any trouble having it, just took a few hours, and I don't remember. Of course, I couldn't bring you home, you were too little, mm -hmm. you know, so we had to leave you there. It was bad when you had to leave a child at the hospital because the other kids began to wonder if you really had a baby there, you know. Yeah. One time we had to get Sisters Rayfield special permission to take some of you there to show them your baby brother. Mm. So anyhow, they were, they were all happy with you. And it was a couple more weeks before I came home? Mm. It wasn't that long. I think just about a week you gained quickly. Mm. And Very how, quickly. How much did I weigh? Three pounds, two ounces, is that right? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. And would have been... But a baby can gain six six ounces in a day real mm -hmm. easy, you know. Hold the milk. They so how anything. early was I, Mom? I see you're born February the 21st, aren't you? <laughs> yes. I think you were supposed to be born in March, honey. Well, yeah. I mean, I was mm -hmm. early. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, this, I, what I've always had in my head was that I was a month premature. I mean, I don't know. Well, I think it was. wasn't quite a month, but see, Brian was Brian came in the in March, and you were more you were more likely to be close to him. Yeah. Instead, you came right after uh, Michael. Yeah, well, and close so after Michael. what you're talking about here, and I, people are fascinated when I tell them this that. My mom and two of my sisters were all pregnant at the same time. And I have one nephew who's a month older than me and another who's a month younger than me. Yes, yes. And that had to be an interesting time. Well, we worked through it. Yeah. I didn't much wasn't very happy going through Linda's wedding, but she wasn't even she wasn't even married yet when she got pregnant. So yeah. Your dad hurried that wedding up, but they Is that okay to talk about that? <laughs> I'm teasing you. I'm teasing you. Now, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, ask you about, is your parents and your grandparents. Because one of the things that was, I feel like, kind of unique and a little bit sad for me as a kid is I didn't have grandparents. I didn't get oh, to have I know. that experience. That was sad. That was sad. And, um, you know, Granny, Dad's mom, was, uh, I just remember her as being angry and kind of nasty and only even remember seeing her a couple times, but she was never saw a smile on her face 
or anything no, like that. No, he wasn't good at smiling. <laughs> well, he he died, and uh, and then she died later. And so she was I don't remember how old you were. I think you were about six when she died. Yeah, it was pretty. Little. I think it was seventy nine. I think is when it was. It sounds right. Mm-hmm. I remember going to pick her up at the nursing home on Christmas Eve one year with Dad, and bringing her back to the house. That's that's really the the most vivid memory I have of her. Is it? But what were your mom and dad like? Oh, they were real nice people. They were loving, and but they were Germans. They had their ideas, and my dad had his ideas on what everybody ought to do, you know. And he didn't want me to get married. He didn't think it was a good idea. Heck, we dated for four years. Father Brian Buck said, you've dated too long now. So he didn't even want you to get married. He, he, oh, no. But you said he oh, liked no. Dad, but he didn't want you to get oh, married. Oh, he did. And if I'd have an evening, you know, and he didn't come or anything, he might, he'd go get him and bring him home to play cards with us. Used to make me so mad. <laughs> but anyway, that's what he did. And anyhow, he decided I wasn't going to get married. And, and oh, we had some awful talks about it. But I finally told him the last time Mom started on it. He told me she I was going to give her a heart attack and she'd die. And she told me that I was breaking my daddy's heart and all that crap. And, so anyhow, when she got done preaching that night out of the cemetery, I said, she said, well, what did you decide? And I said, well, like I said, I'm getting married on the 30th of September <laughs> this year. She said, well, I wish you could get married on the second day of October, because that's when I got married, and that's when my mother got married. And I said, well, none of Jack's brothers and sisters can come if we have it on a weekday. So I'm having it on Saturday the 30th. Mm. So she said, well, we got to get your picture taken. So it, it all turned around then, and we got busy and got it done. But Dad wasn't happy. He was heartbroken. And, but, he, he, but it worked out okay. You got over it, right? They had their they had their um, differences. Your dad, dad, and I, and uh, him. But you know, dad won't tell him what to do. And your dad had been in the army for four years. <laughs> right. I mean, that wasn't a good thing. I mean, right. Tom, anybody would know better than to do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What about your grandparents? What do you remember about them? Oh, I had a wonderful grandmother and grandfather. Now, mom, do you remember like? Before Indiana, where the family came from, just before Indiana, the Nyheisels? Well, they most of them come from uh, over in Ohio someplace. Pennsylvania, Ohio. Mm-hmm. They, the, my granddad and his brother came from, I think it was Bavaria, Germany. Yeah. They well, came over on a boat. Do you, do you know when that would have been? Well, I've 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 got it written down in there. I've I've got the thing that tells the years and all, but I can't tell you offhand. Well, my granddad was born in seventy seven, and he came over on that boat. He so he immigrated. Yeah, the whole family came. Um, and they worked. They landed in Pennsylvania. They worked in the mines there for a while. The coal and then, mines. Uh, Mm-hmm. And then uh, a bunch of them came over here to Ohio, you know, and started working in the mines there. And in the potteries, my granddad, my granddad worked in the pottery. And so did the woman he married. So She only lived till dad was 10. Well, I know. And the uh, the ancestry, you know, research that I have done. It seems like going back generation after generation, there's Jacob F. Nyheisel, Jacob V. Nyheisel, Jacob F., Jacob V., like just generation. I got after about generation. 20 pages of that, and they're all Jacobs and Marys. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. interesting. Do you have any idea where, where the first Jacob came from or why Jacob? Well, they came, they came from Germany. Yeah, but I they mean, it was a long Germany. time ago, huh? Must have yeah, a long time ago. Oh, I got to say, eighteen seventy-seven. 
And then your mom's family came from Ireland, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then do you, do you remember what part of Ireland? What were her parents? Oh, I think like? it's County Mayo. I have no. Oh, my granddad was real strict, and he, nobody talked at the supper table but him. And you don't talk unless you're spoken to. And he was very, very strict. And and they both lived a pretty sheltered life. Mm, both of them, both mm-hmm. your mom and your dad. Well, dad made out all right. His his mother died when he was ten. And his uh, grandmother, her husband died when he he died when he was only thirty five. Mm. So she remarried a guy named Pete Connie, and they had one girl mm. named Marie. And uh, but anyhow, when when my grandpa's wife died, and I don't know how soon it was after, but she moved over here with him and took care of. Uh, my granddad and my dad, hmm. which I always thought was a pretty great person. Yeah. She was wonderful. It really was. Such a good grandma. You go in there on Saturday morning, she would have sweet rolls warming on the registers and raisin. It was just great. It was great. And then, he um, worked. go ahead, what were you going to say? I was going to say he worked at Kingston's. He was a night watchman, which and, is a um, factory, and well, it's a factory down down the street, about ten, eight blocks down the street. And uh, if I was there when uh, he had to go to work, well, he'd uh, we'd sneak out. I'd sneak out the back door and meet him on the corner, and we walked to Kingston's and we'd walk the shift, you know, and. Uh, it was neat. It was really He'd neat. I loved him. doing that with him. Mm. That's a nice thing. It is. We did it often. My brother was pretty little, you know, he was really too little. And he would have been he would have been frightened too, probably because it was pretty dark in some of those sections of the factory and all the big machines and everything, you know, but I wasn't. They made scared. roller skates, right? Oh, they made roller skates. They made lots of things for the war. Mm. And, uh, you know, they got all kind of awards for that. I don't know what happened to the management in that company that that factory went down like that because it really was a fine factory and did a lot of good things. Hmm. Anyhow, I think as a management, I really do. Or not, not enough money, you know, they always say that. Well, so if I think about the important things in your life to you, I mean, probably besides family, I mean, the most important thing to talk about would be the church, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So talk about your first memories around the Catholic Church and your relationship with God. Well, I uh... We went every Saturday, Sunday, you know, to Mass and and uh, all together, and that carried on all through the years. I can remember going to school. We learned all about God and everything that we should know and how to live a good and holy life. Mm-hmm. And then uh, uh, there's a First Communion, you know, and things like that that were very impressive and I do very close to Blessed Mother. Yeah. And I just um, try to keep that in my heart all my life. Well, I think you've done a pretty good job of that, haven't you? I want to. I yeah. want to. That's the most important thing in my life is my church and my family, or my faith and my family. And uh, I try to hold, I've tried to hold on to it my whole life. Well, it's it's been a very difficult thing the way things went, but it hasn't been the way I wanted it, but it happened. Well, and you're talking about, you know, when problems in the church and stopping going to the church at one point. But in spite of all that, I mean, you always prayed. I mean, every single day I, I that was 
I've, I've watched that my entire life. I saw mm-hmm. you praying on your knees. and I hope you all have God. that memory. Yeah. I don't know how because, the rest of them could not. I mean, it. Well, the, the, some of them do and some of them don't, but I think they all have it in them. Yeah. But they might not talk about it, but I'm sure they all have it in it because you can tell different things they do and say that, you know, that they, they know what's, what's important. Yeah. Well, and, you know, the church has had its ups and downs and. Always. Mm-hmm. You know, lots of, always, yeah. And lots of people <laughs> have drifted away. And for me, you know, I mean. It was very hard on our family. Yeah. Well, but, and I have found a way to make my relationship with God work for me. In a diff- you know what I mean? It just, uh, yeah. the, the church, there have been years when I have gone to church and. But most of the time I haven't, but I really don't feel like it has. I mean, I I suppose I could have benefited from having a church community, but I never really I don't feel like it um, has really um, adversely affected my relationship with God. You know, well, and you've had a tendency to look for really good people. God steered me towards those people and vice versa. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm I'm pretty sure that's the truth of it. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I don't know. I've got so many friends in my life, even now that I've made in the, in the Al-Anon groups, you know, yeah. good friends from all over the state. I, I've got a friend that called me up the other day from South Bend. Well, it lives in Warsaw, but it's South Bend. He has been coming to our Al-Anon meetings for three years, Tom, and he drives from Warsaw once a week to come. Yeah, which is three hours, two and a half, three hours. Three hours, three hours away. He and his wife come every single, single week. And they keep up with everybody in the group, and they say it's the best day of their life, that Thursday. Well, so I feel like I've done some good through that. I've been able to help a few people, and I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, well, so am I. I know you are. I know you are. Um, you know, I, I mean, if you listen to this podcast, you know that I stopped drinking when I was 23, and I mean, that definitely needed to happen. But what also happened is that you started going to Al-Anon. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, and that, you know, now that's almost 25 years ago. And um, you've continued to, to maintain that the entire time. And, uh, you know, working in addiction and... Um, being in a position to like advise people to do that sort of thing and, and working with families who suffer from alcoholism and addiction, there are an awful lot of people who will go a time or two and we'll leave it at that. And, you know, we'll kind of have this, well, I've done that sort of attitude, but I mean, to be a young guy in recovery and have my mom work a program in Al-Anon, I mean, that, it, I mean, I feel like in some ways we've been in recovery together. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I know you've been a big help to me over the years. A big help. Well. Thank you for saying it's hard, that. It's hard the way uh, some of our family acted as though it wasn't their problem and they couldn't do anything about it. And so they didn't help in any way. I mean, making things even harder for the person that was a drinker. And I, uh, that's been a awful pain for me through the years. Well, but I wasn't able to help in it. Well, but. Our family's changed a lot. Yes, it has. It has. Yeah. And and the other thing is that <sighs> there's so much shame attached to it 
that it's it's just really hard to talk about. It's hard to face for family members to have a tendency to just kind of turn their gaze away from it. It's easier sometimes, at least in the short term, it feels easier. And, um, you know, I mean, now the work that I do, I mean, I help families. That's what I do because families don't know what to do. They don't know what to do. And the other part of it, I mean, I've watched it with you over the years in different ways. You know, when you have someone in your life who suffers from an addiction, from alcoholism, you want to believe in them. You don't you don't want to think that they're an alcoholic. No, you don't. And when when they tell you they're quitting, you want to believe them. And it, it, it's a really baffling and um, insidious illness in that way. And you can be someone who's trying to stop drinking and say, in all honesty, I'm done. I'm stopping. I'm not I'm not going to drink again. And then in pretty short order, drink again. You know, when it really has control of you. Oh, no. And that's the thing a lot of times that's hard for families to to grasp is that. It's not the person you're fighting. It's the addiction you're fighting. Uncle Charles really had a problem with alcohol. Yeah. And he did tea. He, he would go away for. This was your mom's couple, brother? Your mom's yeah, mom. he would go away and we wouldn't see him for two or three months. And then he'd show up and he'd need a coat and he'd need a job. And, and uh, we'd take care of that. He'd stay with us for week or so and then as soon as he got a paycheck he'd get on the inner oven and leave he was a wonderful kind and gentle and he was a writer right he was a writer he was a painter he did beautiful oils he just very talented but he uh, he had that problem all his life well and you know dad and he had some happy years with his wife and yeah. at the end there are some sober times but his health was ruined by then, you know, and but that's in the, it's his in the family. Absolutely. Well, and dad would tell me this story about how, you know, he broke into a drugstore on a Sunday because in Indiana you can't buy liquor on Sundays. And he broke into right. a drugstore and the police got there and he was just sitting there on the floor drinking. That's right. And he went to jail. I, I don't know if he's there six months or a year. In a big jail. Well, up at, uh, where was that? Up on the edge of Michigan, I think. Mich- I get the Michigan name of it. City. Yeah. Well, that I was, don't know what that, that was, was it one or of those not, jails up there where was one of them. went mm-hmm. and broke out of one of those jails up there. Yeah. Well, he never broke out, but he well, he was um, he was just pitiful. I just I loved him. I loved him, but well, he just. I got his red hair, you always told me. Well, Estelle told me before she died that you were more like him than any of my children. Really? Yes. What made her say that, you think? Well, your attitude and everything, the way you acted, the way you talked, and your hair, of course, and but uh, just a gen- you just have Do a I gentle way you that's more like him. You were, I remind you of him, too? A little bit. Yeah. I, did, I really didn't know him terribly well. Mm. I felt like I did, but really our times of being together were so short, you know, and so yeah. little. Well, but he, was... he was a good man. And, I, and he told us once that he thinks he was an alcoholic by the time he was 16. So you know where he had to get that, don't you? Yeah, well, I mean, it doesn't happen by accident. No, it doesn't. You know, um, when Linda got into it the last time, when she was, well, a couple of years before she died, she started drinking again a little bit and had to go into the hospital. And we didn't know what was wrong with her. She just was acting weird. And, and uh, But anyhow, she talk, started talking about going home. And I said to the nurse, I said, 
you're not going to let her go home, are you? And she said, no, she's in uh, DTs. And I said, what? I didn't know what it was, you know. But it was only the beginning because they had to put her in a coma and uh, strap her to the bed. Listen to this, though. I've, I don't, can't tell you how many people I've told at that Al-Anon meeting. If you ever see a person in DTs that's strapped to the bed and see them bouncing that bed across the hospital floor, you'll know that they have no control over this thing. Yeah. They have no control over it all. They're sick, very sick. It really, really hit me that time when I saw that. I thought, my God, I mean, she doesn't want this. No. No, nobody ever asked for that. No. It's a soul sickness. It is. Yeah. Well, she had a lot of pain, you know, at that uh, the love of her life went out did his thing like he always did, and and uh, she never got over him, Tom. I don't I think that. she ever got over him. Do you? I think well, so. I mean, I assumed that. And, you know, um, one of the reasons why, well, you know, people drink because they don't, you know, they're not effectively managing their emotional experience. And and well, that makes and a lot of times it's because they don't know how. And I mean, God knows for years and years she was trying to process that grief. I know it. She didn't know how to do it. We've seen that in other ways with others. And uh, to me, you know, when people have asked me about being someone who is in recovery and has suffered from alcoholism, there's a belief that it's genetic, and I imagine it's probably genetic. I try to not get in caught up in that kind of stuff because that isn't going to help somebody stop drinking. No, it is. It's not. Mm-hmm. Knowing that isn't going to help somebody stop drinking now eventually i mean it might help them come to terms with some things but but anyway um they would you know what about you have you talked to your son about it how would you and and you know i've talked to him about the history but what has been much more important to me has been listening to him teaching him how to talk about his feelings being someone he could come to to talk to, teaching him how to have boundaries, teaching him how to deal with his emotions. Yes, that's because, really important. Because Tom. for me, that's what I had a problem with. You know, I was sad. I was sad for whatever reasons that, you know, we don't no need to get into here. But, you know, I was trying to to deal with something and that's the only way I knew how at the time. Mm-hmm. And then the next thing you know, I was stuck in it and couldn't stop. And, you know, one of well, the, that's the way we all had fun in those days. Well, yeah, but it used to be a little fun. Well, one of the things I wanted to ask you is so me, you know, at the end of my drinking, I mean, I was pretty bad and, when I was really drinking, I mean, that's all I was doing. You know, it was kind of taking the shape of binges when I wasn't away working. But, yeah, that's what you were doing. But but when I wasn't, when I was home, I was just staying drunk for days and days. I mean, I just can only imagine how painful that must have been to watch for you. To tell you the truth, I didn't realize how bad it was with you. Yeah, I I really didn't because it's a, you handled it pretty good. I thought one day you called me at work and you'd visit with me and everything. By the time I get home, you'd be sound asleep. I yeah. couldn't figure out what was going on, you know. But then that one day when you was bouncing against the wall, I knew something was I don't really bad that, wrong with bouncing you. Bouncing against the well, wall. What was that all about? Well, I was getting ready to go to work and and uh, you came out of your room to go to the bathroom and. Uh, 
Peter's went sideways and was hitting the wall. Mm. And I said, what is wrong with you? And I thought you were doing dope. And, uh, oh, you said nothing, I'm fine. So I, I get a glass and I say, here, fill this for me. Don't you remember that day? No. You don't? No, what happened? I said, he said, well, what is that about? And I said, well, I'm going to see what kind of dope you're doing. And he said, I'm not doing dope, Mom. I'm an alcoholic. And I just thought I'd die. I didn't want to hear that. Yeah. Of course, I knew that you did did too much of it now and then. And I knew Matt was worried about it, telling you what to do, and what the neighbors are supposed to do, and all that stuff that. I thought he ought to be looking at his own self. I, I don't know. I, mean, I was all mixed up, Tom. I didn't. I didn't uh, realize the scope there. Yeah. I felt terrible when you went away. Didn't want you to go, but of course I knew you had to. That was sad. I thought your dad was. He really broke up that night when he had to take you to jail. Did he? Yeah. Yeah, so what she's talking about, I wouldn't stay at the hospital. When I, I went to the hospital the last day I drank and I needed to stay and I refused to stay. And so. Well, I know now you were right. That wouldn't have helped you. Yeah, but but so what happened is uh, instead of taking me home, you know, I got in the car with my mom and dad, and he went back inside the hospital and called the police who came and arrested me for public intoxication. Yeah. And I knew that um, I knew that had to be really hard for him to do. I had to go against everything he believed, probably, in some ways. To That's the truth, honey. That's the truth. Um, but Took everything he had to do that, that night. But he, he couldn't go to he couldn't go to Florida with you. He just told me he said I can't go. Hmm. So that's how it was. Well, but he came for the family program. He did, and that had to do with your friend down there, Jane. Yeah. If it hadn't been for her, I wouldn't have got him down there. And he actually went to a few. Um, uh, Al Anon meetings with me, but all he wanted to talk about was Linda. Yeah. Well, he couldn't get past that. And, you know, that was the worst thing about that. That just got under my skin so bad. You boys had drink too much and make asses of yourself. And he'd say, Boys will be boys. This is there. All right. Mm -hmm. They're just boys. But the girls, they were crackpots. They were nuts crazy yeah no well and, that's 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 the stigma with women and addiction that it's not just him it, yeah is it still that way is it i think it's better but you know i mean uh having the it's training, kind of sad though you know it's really sad they're sick it's too it's no it's not it isn't it's 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 just a stigma it's all it's just a bunch of bullshit but yeah, and, and, you know, I mean, usually when a woman gets caught up in alcohol or drugs, it almost invariably involves a man. Yes. You know? um, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely a thing, and it's not unique to him. I didn't even think about that. All I knew was that's just how it was there, you know. I, I knew he really... Uh, Really, women weren't weren't superior to men in any way. That's the way he was raised in Tennessee, or that's how they did it in Tennessee. Well, I mean, you know, I definitely grew up in a home where the man has the last say, right? Oh, absolutely. And he would talk to me about everything. If at some point, sometimes mm -hmm. it was too late to talk, but. Um, he did whatever, and it didn't make any difference how it went. If it didn't go well, he kept on and on and on trying to make it work. Yeah. He never gave up on it. That's one thing. And he worked hard, and did God love him. That's so all he did was work. But he was so angry when he couldn't work anymore. 
Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Did you realize that? Well, I remember when I was about 14, he was in between jobs and it was pretty terrible watching him. He, he was like a caged tiger walking from one window to another. Looking. I know it. <laughs> yeah, it was sad and, you know, tense. Um, yeah, I remember that was one of the years when I was in all those all star all star tournaments and traveling, playing baseball, and that was all going on at the same time, if I remember right. Um, so, I think you're right on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it makes me sad to think about how hard it was for you guys to to go through that. You know, I mean, obviously, I've given this a lot of thought over the years but you know we've never really talked about that you know the fact that dad couldn't come he couldn't bring himself to come and how hard it was for him to call the police that night i never told you that did i no and i didn't remember the story about when i told you i was an alcoholic i remember having a conversation with him about it but oh dear yeah that was the last day early in the day before i left You know, I've told you this, but it's it was hard to leave and hard to not come back. Oh, I know what I know what was and, and hard Terrible. hard to have been away all this time. But mm-hmm. but I I knew I couldn't come back. I knew I needed to stay away and uh, and you know just. And and it's not like I made a decision to stay away for good in the in the beginning or anything. I mean, what I really decided to do was what I was doing was working. So why quit? You know, I should keep doing it. And uh, and so that's that's really why I stayed. And and about the time I actually started to think about. If not coming back there, moving somewhere in the Midwest or something, you know, there was a time when I started to look around for different jobs around cities in the Midwest. And that was about the time I met Jack's mom. And uh, and so that was that, you know. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. now here we are. Oh, you were in Tennessee quite a while. Well, but I didn't move there, you know. I mean, I was. You were married then. Well, before all that, I was looking to. You know, maybe if maybe live in Indianapolis or Cleveland or somewhere we're closer to home, you know, but. but well, it, that would have been nice. Yeah, but, you know. It's, but you, you were you were where you're needed. I think so. And I feel like um, I feel like you don't hold it against me for for not moving back or anything. Oh, honey, I don't. Don't think that. No, I know that. That's what I'm saying. I'm telling you. That I appreciate that. And, you know, just because I'm not there doesn't mean part of my heart isn't there. But I, I also feel like, um, you know, I'm living out my purpose. Right. Right. And, you know, and on some level, I mean, this is what our family needed from me. That's right. Well, you sure have helped a lot of parts of our family well i've tried it it, uh it's such a gift to be in recovery you know it really is nathan's so happy yeah it's uh it's hard to get you know i mean it can be uh really hard to achieve but you know, once you really get a taste of how good it is, then, you know, you don't want to trade it for anything. And I'll tell you, that's what Linda really did for me as much as anything else is help me see how happy I could be. Did she? Yeah. Yeah. We talked about that. Mm-hmm. How much she talked to me about how much better it would be. And she was right. She was right. A shame she couldn't hang on to it herself. Well, you know, I mean, she suffered a lot. She did the best she could. And, she did uh, suffer and she's a lot. She's at peace. She's at peace. So mm-hmm. the fact that you stayed so persistent with Al Anon has been a really big deal. 
even, you know, in times when I needed to have different boundaries with you, <laughs> like I could have these conversations with you and you would understand them. Uh -huh. That's it's like we spoke the same language. I know it. I know and it. It's, it's really been a That gift. was great. I, I, uh, I felt like you were my sponsor, really. Oh, come on. Well, really. Well, I appreciate you. I did you talk to that. you about a lot of things, and uh, I could talk to you about anything, really. And that was good. It's, you know, my husband and I didn't talk. No, well, I, I remember something about that. <laughs> I just, like you it, said it, in the it, beginning, he wasn't a big talker. Uh, -uh no, he wasn't. And uh, sometimes he'd say something sweet and it'd just about knock you down, you know. He'd mm. be so grateful. But it wasn't that he didn't think things. He no, just didn't say things. I know. Yeah. Well, he had a hard life too, Mom. Oh, I know what I was talking to Beth about something about the family the other day. No, oh, I was telling her how scared he was when we got married. His hand shook so bad he couldn't put the ring on my finger. Mm. The priest had to help him. And she said, you know, I feel sorry for him. She said, come out of a broken home like he did and everything. She says, it was a big deal taking on a wife. Yeah. And I had never thought about it like that. Well, one of the things I've thought about is, um, you know, his dad left when he was little. And, and so... I mean, you know, dad was always there. He was always there. Well, not necessarily at home. Well, but, you know, we always knew he was there. Yeah. I never once yeah. in my life did I ever feel any insecurity around you guys. You know? I think most of the kids would say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean. Uh, That's a good thing that kids don't feel that. I didn't have to worry about that, mm -hmm. you know? And it was really for my, by the time, you know, your children got to be like at my age, um, you know, so many of my peers, their parents were divorced. There's only like two friends that come to mind who their parents weren't divorced. Is that me. right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was just so much divorce in that town and there is mm -hmm. so much in general. It's, you know, I mean, we're not. Oh, really, that factory was bad. Yeah. Yeah, it well, really was. You yeah, used to blame it on the factory. Well, I mean, that's a convenient, but, you know, I mean, people were unhappy or else they wouldn't be looking outside of themselves to try to find happiness, you know? That's right. That's right. So. Are we about to run out of time? Well, there's, hey, we can talk as long as you want, but <laughs> is there, is there anything you want to talk, want to talk about or anything you want to say? What's it been like for you to listen to this podcast? I know you listen. I enjoy listening to you talk to people. I especially enjoy, enjoy that one with John Snyder. And uh, I since I can listen to it on the cell phone, I really appreciate that. Yeah. So, so you know, I, can, I don't have to worry about turning off the computer and all that jazz. I can just listen on this, and it's nice. Yeah. And I like hearing your voice. <laughs> oh, I like hearing your voice too. Well, you know, mom, you, uh, I mean, I, I, how do you understate the fact that you raise such a huge family? Your, your life has been in service to other people. That's the truth. Whether you well, see it that way or not, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. Well, that was my pleasure, you know. That was, I loved that part of my life. And, and I still, I still love my family. That's the most important thing in my life. I, like I said, my faith and my family. And how many grandkids but, do you have, Mom? Oh, I don't know. I think it's 15 or 16. And then a bunch of great grandkids. I have to keep, I have to keep counting. And then I've got some great, great grandkids that I haven't even seen yet yeah and i may not well i guess and it came over when she came over today she told me that they're she and carly are going to come over friday or monday morning for an hour or so and i get to see i should i haven't 
Matt Asher yet, except through a screen door. Yeah, and now that you've been uh, immunized, right? Yeah, I'm immunized. I have been for over a month now. Yeah. But so they're getting ready to go back to Washington. Now she's going to have to go back to work and maybe come back later. But that's just how it goes. Yeah. All right. So the last question I ask everybody, if you had to look back at another time in your life, the younger Martha, if there was a time when she needed a pep talk or some advice, when would that have been and what would you say? Well, I would say that when you get to a certain age, you have to make your decisions for yourself. And you can't let other people influence you. And you shouldn't. I don't know. I, I learned that pretty well when I was about 30 years old. I was still listening to what my dad told me to do, and it did not work. Yeah. It didn't work at all. So finally, I went to confession one day and said, you know, I don't do what mom and dad tell me anymore. He said, how old are you? <laughs> And, you know, I realized that then what I was doing it was yeah. nuts. Yeah. You were beating I was a woman up for it. with children. Yeah. But they were so strong. They were so strong. It took me a long time to learn that. You know, and, and part of the reason I do this podcast is to encourage people to do just that. You know, to listen to yourself because God gives us what we need. I know. And mm -hmm. so many, so many people who I see, you know, just kind of coast through life making decisions based on what they think is expected of them or their parents think they should do or what. I know. I, I and, then, know. and then they're not happy. You know, that's why I say Father Breitenbach was, a, he was a big part of our life and your dad loved him to death. And as long as he was alive, we... We got along fine. If we he had any problems about anything, he'd just go talk to him, and he'd just be so happy. Yeah. But my dad actually went over and told him, forbade him to marry us. Oh. He said, what are you talking about? He said, they're all right to get married, you know. He said, they're going to be fine. They've been dating too long now. And that told me, forbade him to do it. He says, well, I'm going to marry him. Don't worry about it. It'll be all right. Wow. So I told him, I said, well, he says he's not going to come. He says, oh, don't worry about it. He'll be there. <laughs> he did come, but he was very unhappy, but yeah. he got over it. Yeah. Well, but I, you know, I'm, like I'm sorry kid. it had to be that way. There was no other way, Tom. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm glad you did. Glad well, I'm glad did. I did, too. Yeah. I'm glad I did, too. Well, I love you, honey. I love you, too. And, With all you know, my heart. And, and, you know, you've always said that to me. I grew up in a home where we always said I love you. We always hugged and kissed. I know so many people who don't get to have that. And it's Do so you? hard for them to say it. Yes, yes. And, you know, that is a huge gift that you've given me. And, well, thank you. you know, mom, I just. Well, my folks are very loving. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they get mad at you not speak to you for a couple of months, but they were Yeah, loving. well, that's a little overboard, but, you know. <laughs> no, but, it's not. It's the truth. Well, well, I don't, I don't mean it's not true. I mean, it's probably not the best way to do things, but. No, it isn't. But we learn, we learn, but, you know, I just, I don't. I don't know if you really understand how much I value you as my mom. I feel well, like I'm grateful for that. No, I mean, you know, you're so smart and the spirit you have and the joy you have in life. And I feel like, you know, I can talk to you about anything. I feel like probably I got my brains. I hope I got your brains. Because I always felt like you guys, all of us, the whole family, I've always felt like we're all really smart people. I think um, so, too. And your dad's pretty smart, too. Yeah. yeah but mm -hmm. I just the fact that growing up, 
where we talked about current events and, you know, you and I now still can talk about history or current events or just about anything. And, you know, I think there are just so many families who either they just don't get caught up in that stuff or I don't know. It's just I feel like there's I don't so know many, what it is, but but I just feel like there's so many things about you that have influenced how I am listening to music and just just so many things the way you love sports some of the best memories i have is is watching the cubs with you guys just cuz we were together or watching indiana basketball and yeah uh-huh. and it's i've always and our happy, happiest years was going down that ballpark where all you boys play yeah we love that well, we they were the some of my happiest years too to really. well they were but yeah well, I love you, Mom. I love you, too, honey. Thank you for doing I'm that. also proud of you. You're welcome. I'm proud of you, too. All right, there you go. Martha Gentry. No, that was pretty heavy conversation. But, you know, life's heavy sometimes. It's reality. So I really, I don't know that that could have gone any better than it did. It really, really means a lot to me that my mom was willing to do that. And, uh. I'm grateful to her for doing it. So the next episode is going to feature the author Karen Casey, who I've known for many, many years. And I sort of factored into this idea of having my mom on because we had a pretty meaningful interaction years ago, Karen and I, which related to my mom and She inscribed a book that I bought for my mom and I asked her to sign for her and was very gracious and sweet about it. But she's published many, many books, another incredible woman. So that'll be great. Looking forward to having her. So if you enjoyed this, please share it with somebody. I try to make it really easy to do that on the Website, thepathtoauthenticity.com. Leave a rating or a review at Apple Podcasts or Podchaser, wherever it is you prefer to listen. Whatever it is they enable you to do, be it follow, like, subscribe, whatever it is, please do so. Every little bit helps. If you're inclined to become a patron... You can find the show on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash the path to authenticity. This episode will have been available to patrons on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month, six days ahead of time. And in addition to that, the original audio recording that I did with my mom, which I cut out maybe 45 minutes. That was available the night that I did the interview to patrons only. The episodes themselves obviously become publicly available. But the other stuff doesn't. And I also do a special little episode on Saturdays, just a few minutes long. Usually I do some kind of reading. I call it the Saturday Dispatch. That's for patrons only. So, again, just every little bit of support that I can get helps me to do more of this, which I love and I feel like is meaningful. And I want to be able to devote more time and energy to. So that's the point of Patreon. I want to thank the band Punk Rock Opera, whose music you hear throughout the show. Their songs are used with permission from the artist under a Creative Commons license. The Path to Authenticity is proud to support the I Speak Media Foundation. 
I want to thank Wendy Chin at Equivox for all her help and support. She's been fantastic. If you have digital marketing needs, there's a link in the show notes. Wendy Chin, Equivox.com. I want to thank the show's sponsors, The Manor and Windrose Recovery. Again, visit the website, thepathtoauthenticity.com. You can like the show on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram, both at The Path to Authenticity. And there's a link in the show notes for Clubhouse, where I'm doing more and more. I, last night, did sort of an impromptu room where I invited anyone who's on Clubhouse who was a guest of the podcast. I invited I ended up having about a 90-minute conversation with Coach Jilly, who I want to say was around episode 60, but who's awesome. So we talked about love and relationships and online dating, and I really wish I had recorded it because we had a lot of laughs and a lot of fun. It would have been cool to release it, if only for patrons. But check it out, Clubhouse. Link in the show notes. I'm also going to start recording some episodes on there rather than interviewing someone over the phone, doing it on that app so people can listen live to the conversation before it's edited and released as a podcast episode. Anyway, I, I, uh, people seem to be kind of clamoring for this episode with my mom. Everyone I talked to about it seemed really excited to hear it, which was touching to me. And I, I'm not sure she really believed that, but it's very much true. So thank you for listening to the show. Thank you for listening to this episode. Thank you to my mom and my family for everything they've done for me. So I hope you guys have a wonderful Mother's Day weekend. Be nice.
Hey, uh, we need a guitar player. The Path to Authenticity is powered by Equivox. For digital marketing and web design services, visit Equivox.com.